You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode 314 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. How do you picture everyday life for Native Americans in early America? Where do you see Native Americans living? What's around them? What kinds of buildings do they live in? What kinds of jobs and activities do you see them doing? Do any of the mental images that you've just created include images of Native Americans in early American cities and port towns? It turns out that it was actually quite common for early Americans to encounter Native Americans in the European port towns and cities that dotted early North America, especially those cities and port towns along the Atlantic seaboard of British North America. Colin Calloway, an award-winning historian and professor of history and Native American studies at Dartmouth College, joins us to investigate Native American experiences in early American cities with details from his book, The Chiefs Now in This City, Indians and the Urban Frontier in Early America. Now, during our conversation, Colin reveals why it's important to understand interactions and diplomatic relationships between Native American peoples and white Europeans and Americans, why Native Americans visited early American cities, and how Native Americans experienced early American city life and entertainments. But first, just as a reminder that this Thursday, October 28th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern, I'll be participating in a virtual program with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. That program is called Inside Ben Franklin's World, a conversation with Liz Covart. Now, during this hour-long program, I'll speak with the Historical Society's own Anthony Giovanni about the life and times of Benjamin Franklin and about podcasting. So not only are we going to talk about history, we're also going to go for a behind-the-scenes tour of the work and ideas that go into this podcast. Plus, we'll be talking about some Pennsylvania history and connections between the information we explore in this podcast and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania's collections. We'll also leave plenty of time to answer your questions, too. Now, this is a ticketed event, and all funds raised will go to support the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. To learn more about this event, Inside Ben Franklin's World, and to get your tickets, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash inside BFW. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash inside BFW. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Okay, ready to investigate Native American experiences in early American cities? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Our guest is the John Kimball Jr. 1943 Professor of History and a Professor of Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. His research specialty is in Native American history and in early American relations between Native Americans and white people. He's an award-winning scholar who has written numerous books, including his most recent book, The Chiefs Now in This City, Indians and the Urban Frontier in Early America. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's World, Colin Calloway. Thank you, Liz. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me. Well, we're really excited to have you back, Colin. And I had to look this up because in my mind, it hasn't been so long since we spoke. But in reality, it's actually been quite a long time. We last spoke in episode 29 when we talked about your then new book, The Victory with No Name, which was about the American defeat at the Battle of the Wabash in 1791. And since that time, Ben Franklin's World has published nearly 300 episodes. Wow. And you've published two or three different books since we last spoke. And all of those books have explored relationships and interactions between Native American peoples and white Europeans and Americans. So I wonder if we could start our conversation by having you tell us, you know, what is it about these interactions between Native Americans and white people that so fascinates you and has really driven you to research and write many, many books on this subject? Yes, I think in many ways, to me, this is, I suppose, what Ken Burns would say was an American story. And as a 
non-American looking at American history. To me, it is the story, the encounter, conflict, collision, however we describe it, between people of European descent and indigenous populations. I think it's fundamental not only to understanding Native American history, but to understanding American history. And I think, as we all know, for a long time, that aspect of American history was given short shrift. So I think as somebody who defines their work as quite simply doing American history with American Indians in it, there are endless possibilities. You slice American history any time and place, and there's a story of encounter and relationships between indigenous and non-native people to be told. I'm also curious why your focus on these studies of the interactions between Native Americans and white people tend to focus on diplomatic relationships and interactions. Because even in your new book, The Chiefs Now in the City, you do talk some about cultural interactions between Native Americans and the inhabitants of early American port cities you do spend most of your time investigating the diplomatic relationships and interactions that took place in early American cities. Yes, thanks for catching that. I said this is not a book about diplomacy, and obviously it's a book about (laughs) diplomacy. And that's the context for it, of course. And I think diplomacy is so important to understanding early America and to understanding these relationships that we're talking about. Because diplomacy is something that nations conduct, that Indian nations conduct foreign policies, as do European nations. That's a strategy, if you like, that's not always accorded to them. So I think there's that aspect of it. Another aspect that I find appealing and attractive for me as a non-native historian is that, of course, there's an element of, let's call it Indian white diplomacy that takes place in the public sphere, that's heavily recorded. And so it's an area in which I, I think as a non-native historian, feel that I can operate and that I'm not trying to tell indigenous stories that belong in the communities. Those kinds of things, I focus on those records, which are sometimes quite detailed. And the other thing I'd say why I believe these are so important is that as we think about the birth of this nation, there are certain texts and documents that are revered, almost given a sacred status. One is the Declaration of Independence that created the independence of the United States. The other is the Constitution that set up the system of government of the United States. And the third, I would argue, is the body of Indian treaties that create the land base, the territorial foundation of the United States. So one and two enjoy a revered status. The third category, I think, is too easily dismissed. And looking at those diplomatic relationships, I think, gives us as a historian a reality check on what the world was like back in the 1790s or the 1750s, where Indian nations were not yet the dispossessed, defeated peoples that become such a part of the narrative of U.S. history. But very often, they were people who were calling in the shots. So I think that, as I look at it, it's an arena of cultural exchange, which is endlessly fascinating. But it's also a way of perhaps recalibrating how we think about, let's call it power relations in early America. Well, let's dig into some of these power relationships and what they would have looked like in the context of where so many of them took place, which was in early American cities. Mm -hmm. Now, in Colin's book, The Chiefs Now in This City, Colin investigates Native American experiences in early American cities. And he does this from what Native Americans saw and experienced while visiting these early American urban spaces to what their interactions were like with the whites who lived and governed in these spaces. Now, Colin, Jenny wonders if you could talk to us a bit about cities in early North America. She wonders if these urban spaces were always European or Euro-American places, and also wonders whether they were always along the Atlantic seaboard. Yeah, for the purposes of the book, which is heavily 18th century, those are essentially the places, the urban spaces 
that I'm looking at, predominantly port cities. And I think port cities, for my purposes, open up possibilities about thinking of these as frontier arenas, frontier worlds for Indian people in important ways. But I think to think of cities as only European and only on the East Coast has been misleading. And so early on in the book, I do a kind of very quick helicopter flight over 10,000 years of American history and say there were cities here, cities there, etc. Looking at urban centers that were indigenous, the obvious example would, of course, be Cahokia. And that raises the question, which your question alludes to, of course, is what constitutes a city? And I read a lot of urban geographers and other people to get the answer and realize that people don't agree on this and people still don't agree. People still have different understandings of what constitutes a city. I grew up in a town in the north of England, which had, I think, 60,000 people, or I grew up on the edges of it, which was a town. And then I remember when I moved to Vermont, New Hampshire, the first place I ever taught was in Keene, New Hampshire, which had, when the college was in session, I think had 20,000 people and called itself a city. So even now there are those discrepancies. And I think when we think of cities, we think of cities with the infrastructures and the institutions that we associate with cities rather than simply with numbers of people. But I wanted to suggest just in terms of numbers of people, we're looking at those similar concentrations. Because if you have a lot of people living in the same area, then that puts strains on environment. It requires social systems that function, et cetera, et cetera. You can't say that people are just primitive without effective social organizations if you've got 20,000 people living in, in one area. And there are plenty of examples of that. And I suppose even at this time frame that we're looking at, if you look at the Mandan Hadatsa villages on the, the Missouri River that Liz Fenn has written about recently, those are, I would say, indigenous cities. They don't look like Philadelphia or Boston, but they function as trade centers. They support large populations. They have the economic base to do that, to agriculture, and they are places where people from other nations and I'm thinking of Spanish, French, Canadian, British traders, go and hang out. And they do that to trade, but I think they're also there, in a sense, almost as ambassadors to create that connection. So what I wanted to suggest in the book was that Native people who traveled to Charleston or Philadelphia were not coming out of tradition and a history where the idea of a lot of people living in one place was totally alien and unknown. Clearly, by the 18th century, most of the native visitors are coming from smaller communities. Nonetheless, these are functioning polities. I think that's the term that I would use. So Native Americans, it sounds like, were very familiar with urban-like spaces, you know, places where lots of people were able to gather. But I wonder... What was the specific draw of early American white urban places for Native Americans? So I'm thinking of cities like Boston and Philadelphia and New York and Charleston. What was the draw of these white urban spaces for Native Americans? Well, I think there's a number of things. One is, of course, that they are centers of power. And going back to our thinking about the diplomacy of early America, People go to conduct that kind of business where the centers of power are. So Europeans will often go to key places in Indian country and native leaders come to, well, Philadelphia and do it very often. So there's that. And sometimes the Europeans want that. So you have colonial leaders in Philadelphia saying, you must come to Philadelphia because this is where the fire has been kindled and we want to encourage that. Other times, Native people are coming so often that they're actually trying to discourage them. So yeah, we'd like you to come, but give us plenty of notice. We don't want people just turning up. So there's the political and diplomatic dimension, of course. I think there's also the fact that Indian people come to cities to trade or in conducting diplomacy, not necessarily so much to create treaties where you're ceding land, but to create alliances 
which are the precondition for a trading relationship. I wouldn't dismiss the possibility of curiosity, that these are impressive centers, impressive communities for anybody in the 18th century, native or non. And so there's that sort of magnetism that will bring people to them. They can be places where native people go, not only, I think, to act out leadership roles, but perhaps to attain experience or to demonstrate their leadership role. And I think that in the new world of relationships that we're talking about, dealing with Europeans, dealing with colonists, becomes a key dimension of leadership. And so going, if you like, to the heart of the beast and representing the tribal nation's interests in that place gives one credibility and status. And sometimes that may be imagined, perhaps in native communities, but it can become real whether European or the colonizing power acknowledges, recognizes, or even boosts that status by saying, well, okay, you're the person we deal with. That means that that person has an importance. So I think there's a range of attractions and a range of reasons for people going that go from the large umbrella inclusion of dealing with these other people down to almost a personal level. And I also I make kind of suggestions in the book that sometimes Indian people kind of go in as tourists. I don't think that's the main reason why they're going, but while they're there, Indian people who turned up at Montreal at the beginning of the 18th century for that massive treaty, seems like they went shopping. So there's a new experience there. Yeah. I guess even though we're talking about cities in this early American period in the 18th century is really where we're focusing, you know, even back then, cities had markets, they had shops, they had ports, they had theaters, and really all sorts of amusements and all of these different aspects of city life would have attracted people, whites and Native Americans. So I guess it's really not all that far-fetched to think of Native American tourists in cities just because there were so many curiosities there. Yeah, and I think they are nodes for early America to which people very often gravitate whether they are Native or non-Native. doesn't necessarily mean that they want to stay there, but these are well, if you look at those, a very simple map that pinpoints the location of these cities, they are each in their own area, a central point that de- in many ways that demands attention. In your research, I'm curious if you found any instances where white Americans and white Europeans were visiting Native American spaces to conduct trade and diplomacy. And I ask this because, you know, I know from my research on Albany, New York, that the state of New York was constantly inviting the Haudenosaunee peoples to come and trade and negotiate at Albany. Mm -hmm. And we know from other authors we've spoken with on the show, I'm thinking of Carl Thrush and his work, Indigenous London, where Native American delegations went to major European cities to conduct trade and diplomacy. And even Andres Resendez and his work, The Other Slavery, which shows us how Spaniards forced Native Americans to travel to Spain. So it just you know, from the body of sources that we've consulted lately, it really just seems like Native Americans were always the ones who traveled to meet Europeans and Americans and conduct diplomacy in European and Euro-American spaces. So I'm just wondering if that's just something that we're missing, that white Americans and Europeans did go to Native American spaces to conduct trade and diplomacy. Well, I think it's accurate and interesting because I think for a long time, we didn't pay enough attention to Native people in, say, European cities. And now, of course, with the work of people that you've talked about and others, you could be forgiven for thinking that you couldn't visit London in the 18th century without bumping into a Haudenosaunee delegation or a Cherokee delegation. And as I thought about this book, it was American cities that were getting short shrift there because we knew that Indian people went to Europe and we knew that European people went to do business in Indian country, in Indian villages. It seemed to me that it was the American cities that were being missed out in the middle, etc. And of course, Europeans do go to native towns, native communities to conduct business in Indian country because of the close relationship of trade and allegiance. Of course, this was 
not only an incentive, but very often a necessity for people whose intent was to conduct business in Indian country. Well, to conduct business in Indian country, you have to be, to put it simply, a real person. So you need to establish those ties and those relationships. But you also have, of course, delegations of commissioners from the colonies, from the Brits, from the French, and later on from the United States government who go into Indian country to conduct business. So, for example, in the late 1780s, when George Washington and Henry Knox are trying to establish a relationship and establish a treaty with Alexander McGillivray and the Creek Confederacy, first of all, they send commissioners to Creek country, and that does not go well. And so then they invite Alexander McGillivray and the Creeks to New York City, which is the then capital, which is a little bit, I describe it and think of it as like a state visit. And I think some of the similar ritual and formality and significance attaches to some of the delegations sent from colonial powers into Indian communities. To return to Native American experiences in British American cities, what did Native Americans make of these colonial cities? When they entered Philadelphia, Boston, New York, Charleston, what did they see and experience upon their entry? Yeah, that's the question that motivated me in many ways to write the book, which is ironic because it's the question that I can't answer. I'm a British guy. How, how do I do this? So I, I actually just pulled the blurb off the back of the book that uh, Dan Usner wrote, and he says, Calloway does various things. He invites the reader to experience those urban places from the perspective of their American Indian visitors and residents. Now, I wish I'd written that because I think Dan nicely captures what I, I hope I'm trying to do is not say, this is what Native Americans thought and experienced, because obviously I'm a little handicapped in being able to speak with authority on that. But rather, the book is rather suggestive. Okay, so think about this. What might this have been? How could this have looked? And very often, as you'll see from the book, what I use is not accounts by Native people visiting cities, but sometimes accounts by Europeans visiting the cities, who are not the people to convey what Native Americans experience, but they can and do describe the same things that Native people saw when they were visiting those same cities about that same time. And I think considering that and then looking at these encounters, these visits, through a lens of what we know about what was going on and some familiarity with Native American societies and experiences with Europeans, etc., some things become fairly apparent. But I think it's What's the phrase? Looking at something through a glass darkly. But that is really what intrigued me. And I wanted to write this book because I came across so many instances of Native people in the city. First of all, there were so many instances of Native people in the city. It's just that in itself, I think, is important to convey that a lot of Native people went to these cities and some of them went a lot of times. But also they spent a lot of time there, that there were sometimes delegates who were in town for weeks and even months. And what were they doing? And the records of what was going on are pretty sketchy. But in doing that, they were encountering all those aspects of city life. As you say, going to the theater, shopping in the markets, visiting the docks, seeing not only those aspects of the city that the colonial powers and the city fathers wanted them to see to impress them, but also, of course, seeing, shall we call it, the underside of city life, which sometimes is just kind of interesting, wondering what they got up to, but sometimes, of course, gives an opportunity to suggest an indigenous critique of these cities because some of the things that they saw ran so counter to the ways in which we know indigenous societies operated, where there was both an ethic and a function to how you cared for people, looked after people, etc., and then confronted with things like prisons and poorhouses 
and jails and lunatic asylums, let alone the public administration of punishments for things like stealing a loaf of bread or something. Those things clearly jarred with Native peoples. And sometimes they say that. Sometimes they're quite clear about that. But often, you're right, finding these Native critiques and these Native commentary, this is very often needles in haystacks, and they may be embedded in a lengthy newspaper account, things like that. Joanne would really like to know how we know what we know about Native American experiences in white early American cities. So Colin, we need to pause for a moment so that we can thank our episode sponsors. We're really grateful for their support. But after we give our thanks, we'd like to have you talk to us a bit more about the historical record that we have when it comes to recounting Native American experiences in early American cities. Benjamin Franklin often used his poor Richard's Almanac to provide useful advice to his readers, including advice about money and finances. Within the pages of his Almanac, Franklin was known to share maxims, pithy sayings like, a penny saved is a penny earned. An investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. And rather go to bed without dinner than to rise in debt. So given Ben Franklin's interest in money, savings, and debt, it's quite fitting that today's episode sponsor is Lightstream, a division of SunTrust Bank. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve better loan experiences. And that's exactly what they aim to deliver. Lightstream also understands that you may not know how much you're paying in credit card interest. So Lightstream has a credit card consolidation loan that can help you consolidate your credit card debt and keep your interest payments low. For example, you can get a loan from Lightstream from $5,000 to $100,000 with absolutely no fees. And rates start at 4.98% APR with auto pay and excellent credit. You can also get access to your loan as soon as the day you apply. Now, just for my listeners, apply now to get a special interest rate discount and save even more. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash BFW. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash BFW. Loans from Lightstream are subject to credit approval. Rates range from 4.98% APR to 19.99% APR and include a half percent auto pay discount. Lowest rate requires excellent credit. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash BFW for more details and information. Hi, I'm Carolyn Eastman of Virginia Commonwealth University, and my newest book, The Strange Genius of Mr. O, The World of the United States' First Forgotten Celebrity, is out now. During the early 19th century, James Ogilvy was the very face of eloquence. He had been a burned out immigrant school teacher who discovered that he had a real knack for the spoken word, delivering thoughtful and passionate speeches. And in 1808, he decided to abandon the schoolroom and undertake a career as a traveling public speaker. The reason why Ogilvy matters so much to the history of early America is that he was, in essence, the first great public speaker who vast numbers of early Americans were able to see. He was somebody who was terribly eager, not just to make a name for himself, but also to help Americans imagine a kind of, maybe not unity, but at least he could get them unified in thinking together about the same subjects. And he succeeded. (laughs) One of the most remarkable things about his story is how long he succeeded in doing exactly that. Be sure to pick up your copy of The Strange Genius of Mr. O wherever you buy your books. And if you'd like to purchase your copy of The Strange Genius of Mr. O at a 40% discount, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Mr. O and use promo code 01BFW. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Mr. O and use promo code 01BFW. Colin, Joanne would like to know how we know what we know about Native American experiences in white early American cities. Could you tell us about the historical record that we have and what the sources in that record reveal about Native American experiences in white American cities? 
Yeah. And sometimes native people who travel to cities leave records because the idea that you can't write Native American history because Native Americans didn't leave written records is actually not true. Some did. Joseph Brandt, Alexander McGillivray, Hendrik Oppermann, various other people, they wrote and they wrote about their experiences in the cities. And there's a line I always like from Joseph Brandt where he's talking about being in London. And he goes out on the town at night with the Prince of Wales and says that the prince took him to some places that seemed like a very queer place for a prince to go. And as I say in the book, I think Joseph Brandt clearly didn't know the royal family. So there are those kinds of things. They don't tend to keep a journal in the way that, say, some European visitors would. European visitors who are keeping a journal because they're visiting this new nation and here are the cities. That doesn't happen so often, but there are Native American commentary. There's Native American commentary that comes through the diplomatic exchanges that are taking place where they will refer to certain things or Native people who will intercede to prevent or alleviate the administration of what the Europeans would call justice, because these were so alien to their ideas of how people treated one another. And there's also, I think, a lot of times, and this is a little bit like welcome to doing Native American history, often what we're doing is reading records, even records by non-Native people, to tease out of them what we can glean about Native ways of thinking. One of the passages that I found that I liked very much was the governor of Pennsylvania saying to a delegation of Haudenosaunee people, basically, so when you go home, we hope that you will tell people back home that we were hospitable and generous and nice people too. And clearly what he's talking about is a situation where those values of hospitality and generosity that are central in Native communities' treatments and welcoming of strangers, Pennsylvanians are still striving to achieve and are aware of it. So I think there's a lot of ways in which you are kind of teasing these things out of the records so that we're not entirely dependent on finding here is a Native person making an explicit comment or giving an in-person description of what's going on. You can see it in other ways, too. So to poke at this concern of the governor of Pennsylvania, how hospitable were early Americans to the Native American peoples who visited their cities? Did Native Americans feel accepted and welcomed in early American cities? And I ask this in part because I've read a lot of the early Albany Common Council minutes, and there were some early ordinances that basically said Native Americans could not spend the night inside the city gates, that when yeah. they fell, Native Americans were to exit the city and camp outside. That's right. Was this pretty typical? Were all early American cities this hospitable to Native Americans? So I think there's a mixture here going on because sometimes there's the notion that Native people coming, especially if they're coming in numbers, may represent a threat. And so there are these kind of ordinances, as you say, for Albany. Yeah, when Native people come to visit, this is where you guys live. There are places on the outskirts of the city to live, and we don't want you inside the walls at a certain time. Certainly that's the case. There's very often an underlying apprehension among city fathers and city dwellers that Indian people in the cities may be a threat because if they get hold of alcohol, we don't want drunken Indians on the streets, they say. On the other hand, I think reception can vary according to what's going on. So at times of hostility and conflict and violence, I suspect that Indian people entering colonial cities entered a fairly hostile environment and maybe a pretty frosty reception. On the other hand, when Alexander McGillivray and the Creeks come to New York, it's the biggest turnout since George Washington's visit and People are clamoring to see Native people and seem to be welcoming them with open arms. For Native people, I suspect entering a city could be a fairly tense 
moment because I would imagine that the inhabitants of the cities who are there to see them probably occupy every point across the spectrum in their attitudes towards Native people. And that's something I really didn't get into, if you like, diversifying or individualizing the responses of city residents to Native people. Clearly, we know that this could be a very tense entrance because of the measures taken or the reports of Indian peoples on their way to the cities and sometimes on their way from the cities being threatened and sometimes in some cases violently attacked. So I think for Native people, this was not a step that they took lightly. It sounds like early American city dwellers really had a lot of fear and apprehension when it came to Native Americans visiting their cities. And this is really curious because it also sounds like early Americans in cities often had everyday experiences Mm -hmm. with Native peoples. And I'm thinking here of Nancy Shoemaker's work about Native American sailors and wellmen and others who worked the maritime trades. And also about your book, The Chiefs Now in the City, where you explore how Native peoples lived in early American cities and often worked side by side with white city dwellers. So it doesn't seem like white Americans should have been so surprised when Native Americans turned up in their cities and been so fearful. I have just one chapter in the book where I talk about the Native people who are in town anyway. They don't have to come part as a delegation because that's where they are. They are working there. There are servants, laborers, soldiers, or even sailors, especially in port cities. So they are part of, if you like, the fabric of urban life. They perhaps lack that, shall we say, exotic quality of the creeks arriving in New York. But that's really interesting to me, and I make a kind of allusion to it without really having any hard evidence, that if we think about reception and the people along that spectrum of responses to Indian delegates arriving in the cities. What about the Indian people who were urban residents who were in that crowd? How do they respond to Indian people from many cases from much farther afield coming there? What does this mean? How do they react to this? Seem a little weird, a little strange for there to be this public event and almost ceremonial welcome of Indian people when they themselves are Indian people and they're they're there all along. And I think that, of course, is a book. And other people have have written about that, and it deserves to be written about much more. When In doing it, I really focused as much as anywhere on Boston, and just sort of looked at that area. In thinking of ways in which Native people, in the wake of violence and the disruption of their economies, instead of, or as well as, pulling away from cities, actually gravitated towards cities to make a new life for themselves, to rebuild a way of making a living. And in some cases, the word I'm going to use is disappeared into city life. I'm thinking of Jeannie O'Brien's work on how Indian peoples in New England were disappeared. They were written out of history. But being swallowed up into urban life is another form of that. And of course, this is what the American government had in view, had in mind in the 1950s and 60s with its relocation program to relocate Native people to the cities. The idea was that they would be swallowed up and disappear in city life. But I think visibility is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. You do spend a lot of time in the Chiefs now in this city, really looking at what happens when large Native American diplomatic delegations enter early American white urban centers, places like Philadelphia. And Keith wonders if and how early American cities might have served as places of interaction between different Native American peoples. So was it possible that, say, a Cherokee delegation might be in town at the same time as a Creek or Haudenosaunee delegation was in town? And if that was possible, did Native Americans view these encounters, these chance encounters, as opportunities to conduct intertribal diplomacy or relations? Yes. And I think for the reason we talked about earlier, thinking about these cities of nodes where people go to conduct business, you don't necessarily need to go there to conduct business solely with the people living in that city. So if you think about a treaty like the huge treaty of Montreal, that becomes a gathering point for what I would call a multinational summit meeting. 
where it's not just the Haudenosaunee and the French, but Indian nations from half a continent away, and Indian nations who might have traveled a thousand miles from, say, the Western Great Lakes to meet in Montreal. So I think there's a part of that that very often when there are these multinational meetings, tribal delegations do this consciously. And there are occasions when tribal delegations in cities meet other Native people that they hadn't intended or planned to meet. Creeks and Cherokees in Charleston, the event in the 1790s when Blue Jackets delegation, Shawnees and other peoples from the Ohio country are in town in Philadelphia and they're getting a tour of Peel's Museum and they walk around a corner and they bump into a delegation of Choctaws and Chickasaws and people from the South who are not just members of a different tribal nation, but certainly in the case of the Chickasaws, had served as allies of the United States in the recent war with the Shawnees. So there was an awkward moment. So I think that it's a good question because it points to that function of these cities as places that do attract people. And they attract people for multiple purposes. And I would say that very often those purposes reflect the agendas of the tribal delegation rather than solely the agendas of, say, the Europeans who are inviting them. To put it briefly, going to town could be a good way for Indian people to meet Indian people. Rob has a follow-up question of sorts in that he'd like to know if you've ever found any instances in your research where different delegations of Native American peoples came to the same city to work across purposes from each other. So have you found any instances where one Native group came to negotiate a treaty or alliance that worked against a treaty or alliance of another Native American people. And I think what he's really asking here is, were cities places where intertribal rivalries manifested? I suppose the example that I just gave is a little like that, although by that time, both sets of delegations are in town to negotiate or reaffirm peace with the United States. So even in that case, I'd say, Sometimes the tribal delegations are coming for specific tribal purposes to renegotiate a specific treaty or the terms of a specific treaty. I'm thinking of Cherokees doing this, which puts them in, a, in that urban environment at a time when other tribal delegations are there who are not there for those purposes. I think there's that. The other thing I'd say, which is not to tap dance around Rob's question, I think it's a good question, but also to think of single tribal delegations or even single tribal people in cities where there are competing diplomacies and the competing diplomacies are European. So I'm thinking of Joseph Brandt visiting Philadelphia and he turns down the opportunity to have dinner with George Washington and instead goes and has dinner with Robert Liston, the British ambassador. And I suppose this is maybe a better answer to your previous question, Liz. You go to Philadelphia and you get a twofer. You can deal with the American government or not, but you also get to deal with the British government. And in Brandt's case, he knew that dealing with the British ambassador would serve his purposes because the Americans would know about it, but it would also have reverberations in Canada where he's got his own thing going on. So yeah, I think when I have set up Early American cities said, let's think about them as a frontier. And of course, one of the pitfalls of that is it conjures up a view of the frontier that we all struggle against as it having two sides. And it's actually more a zone in which different kinds of people for different purposes are rubbing shoulders and doing all that kind of thing. I think of the cities of like that, and they're like that for Indian people too. I should have pluralized it and said, urban frontiers, where Indian people are not only encountering Europeans or white Americans, but they're also very often encountering other Indian people and sometimes rubbing up against them as well. It's really interesting to think about how these kind of diplomatic relationships and games between sovereign nations and sovereign people still happen in our own day, right? Where, say, the French and the Americans will meet in Geneva, Switzerland to work out some sort of deal, but neither side, neither the French or the Americans are there 
to meet with the Swiss or how an American ambassador might go, you know, to the Netherlands where he'll meet with someone from China who just happens to be there to conduct business in Amsterdam. So it's really just fascinating to think about the kinds of parallels between today and those 18th century encounters that you were just talking about, you know, between Native American diplomatic delegations and others who also happen to be in early American cities. Yeah. Or the other thing I often think about is state to state diplomacy is going on. And meanwhile, Prince William and Kate come to the United States or Canada on a visit. So they are not necessarily charged with the conduct of diplomacy, but it has implications. And it has reverberations and might actually have more visibility than other things that are going on. I'd like to talk a bit more about these state visits because you do spend a fair amount of time in your book, The Chiefs Now in This City, talking about how Native American delegations in the 1750s and even earlier into the 18th century were really viewed as powerful, sovereign nations. And whites were eager to conduct diplomacy with them, you know, both for the purposes of trade and for the purposes of safety and wartime diplomacy. But when I read your book, it seems that that view of Native Americans as powerful, sovereign nations, nations that needed to be taken seriously and welcomed in early American cities with open arms, really changed Mm -hmm. as the United States emerged as an independent country. Could you talk to us about this change in treatment of Native Americans and why Americans had viewed them as powerful, sovereign nations. And then by the late 1790s, it really started to view them as, I think you put it, needy, supplicant nations. Yes, I think I probably got pulled into writing this book, probably in the course of writing my last book on the Indian world of George Washington, because there was an awful lot of Indian business going on in Philadelphia in the 1790s, particularly the early part. And some of those delegations were the delegations I talked about, the corn planted delegation in Seneca's weather. They're in town for weeks and weeks. They spend, you know, they have an exchange of speeches with George Washington, but they're in town a long time. And there are a lot of them. There's a passage that I like to cite where it's pointed out that George Washington has dinner. This would be dinner in the afternoon. In the course of one week, he has dinner on four different days with four different Indian delegations. And that's not because George Washington liked having Indians over for dinner. That's because he understood that these people mattered and that Indian power still mattered. And of course, one of the reasons why George Washington is meeting with Indian people in the early 90s is because He's just lost the only army that he has, and which we talked about last time I was on the show. The Indian Confederation in the Northwest destroyed the American army. Well, at the very least, the United States government has to engage in some pretty urgent diplomacy, if only to buy itself time, and if only to prevent the Iroquois throwing in with the now victorious Northwestern Confederacy. So there's a lot going on there. And I think that very busy period in Philadelphia's native diplomacy sort of hooked me. I really want to understand this. And then, of course, when that crisis passes, the war for the Northwest is won with the Treaty of Greenville. The borders of the United States are somewhat secured with treaties with Britain and with Spain. Then Indian power becomes less of an immediate threat. And to put it bluntly, the United States can get on with the business of building a nation on Indian land. So that Indian diplomacy that previously has always been to some extent about the transfer of land, but has often been about other things too, increasingly now becomes that's the goal. And so I think it's because of the shift in the power dynamics, the removal of viable diplomatic and, if you like, allegiance alternatives as the British and the Spanish sort of fall away and the Indian people have to deal exclusively with the United States. Those shifting power dynamics generate a concomitant shift in the nature of diplomacy. It becomes much more 
as I see it, top-down, one-dimensional diplomacy. Indian people will still be invited to the seat of government, and they are in large numbers throughout the 19th century to Washington. But I think there's a different character and caliber to that diplomacy, where it's much less now meetings and official visits between representatives of sovereign nations than it is people from indigenous nations who are, in the eyes of the United States government, domestic dependent nations, to cite the Supreme Court. That creates a different character and conduct to that diplomacy, I think. Colin, when you think back on all the research that you've done for this book, The Chiefs Now in This City, and even your previous books, because you did mention how The Chiefs Now in This City builds upon information that you found when writing The Indian World of George Washington. When you look back on all of this research, what do you think the most important, or perhaps surprising is a better word, What did you find to be the most surprising aspect of Native American visits to early American cities? I think I'd say a couple of things. One is just volume. I think just the number of times that Native people visit American cities is important. Just recognizing that, that changes a lot about how we think, not necessarily only about Native Americans, but about the fabric of early American society and and also what life was like in these cities. In terms of the what I found surprising, I suppose, even though I knew a little bit about it because I was aware of the so-called four Indian kings in England going to the theater and having to watch Macbeth on the stage, and that, was how much information there was, and this may be distorted because I'm getting this from newspapers, etc., about Native American delegates going to the theater and visiting the circus. These things almost are an exception to what I was saying earlier about having to look for needles and haystacks as you're working through the newspapers, announcements that the Indian delegations in town will be at the theater tonight. And it's a way of boosting ticket sales. If you want to see the Indian delegates in town, the place to see them is at the theater tonight where you can watch them watching the play or watching the circus. And the other side to that being what seems to be the willingness of Native people or the interest of Native people in doing that. So Atakula Kula, little carpenter of the Cherokees, had been to the theater in London as a young man in the 1730s. And he goes to the theater in New York on his way to a treaty council with the Iroquois in the 1760s. So I think there's a mileage there that I haven't really fully exploited. But to think of Indians in early America as theater goers, what does that say? And it gets at issues of which I only touched the surface about performance, Indians in unexpected places, representation, and all of that. What happens and what does it mean when a little turtle goes to the theater and to the circus? How does that alter our perceptions, not only just of Native people, but our perceptions of how urban residents at that time perceived Indian people? Did it alter their, if you like, stereotypical thinking about Indian people and what Indians represented and what Indians did? I find that really intriguing. That subject alone, the theater and Native American attendance, sounds like a fascinating and very interesting book. Yeah, but not for me. (laughs) That's okay. I really think somebody will write that book. But now we should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, Colin, what might have happened if Native Americans hadn't been so willing to travel into European and Euro-American urban centers? How might the history of Native white diplomacy and interactions have been different? I always hate this question. (laughs) Because when I look at Native American history, I always think not how things would have been differently, but things were they were they were 
in large part because of Native American participation. So now I have to sort of back up and say, okay, extract that and think about it. But I can think of examples, for instance, the Great Peace of Montreal. That was not just Indian people meeting with some French guys or the Treaty of Montreal and coupled with the peace at Albany. Those Indian people who traveled to those cities reconfigured the kind of diplomatic map of North America. This charted in a new era of Haudenosaunee Iroquois foreign policy, but that had multiple repercussions throughout the continent and affected the course of North American history. And I think you could do a similar reading backwards from any number of these treaties if delegations had not traveled to Charleston or Philadelphia to make that treaty. How that might have been different? What was accomplished by doing that? Would it have just been the same to have gone into Indian Creek? Well, in trying to accomplish a multinational summit meeting, that would have been extremely difficult, but it happened in Montreal. Had Indian peoples not been willing to come to Philadelphia in the 1790s, would George Washington and the American government have been able to weather the crisis that the young republic faced in the first years of its existence after the Constitution? Because I think that that military disaster, which left the United States essentially defenseless in 1791, was one of the major crises that was faced. How would that have played out had not Complanter, Red Jacket, and the various other people who came to the Philadelphia and then from there to reach out, if you like, to the members of the Indian Confederacy? How would that have worked? And I think if had things not occurred this way, then I think perhaps the frontier, and I apologize, I keep using the F word, but the frontier would perhaps have looked more like popular culture and some history books portray it as something that rigidly divided early America from Indian country. It would have looked more like that. It wouldn't have been completely that image. But I think it wasn't like that. And one of the reasons that it wasn't like that was because Indian people were coming to town. So that's not a single good answer, but it's a few answers as I sort of tap danced around your question. Now, Colin, you publish a lot of books. In fact, I'm really in awe of your productivity because it seems like every year or two, you have a new book out. Do you have another book in the works that we can expect to see in the next year or two? Yes, I am. I'm working on what is proving to be the most difficult book that I've ever done, I think. The working title is Scotch-Irish Invasion of Indian Country. I earlier did a book on Highland Scots and American Indians, and Highland Scots is a good part of my family, more than half. So those I kind of thought of as, these were my people. This is not more of the same, and I don't feel the same affiliation to Scots-Irish. But one of the things that has struck me is that As a historian of Native American, we're constantly looking and trying to appreciate the diversity and variety in Native responses and different tribal backgrounds and experiences, etc. And we don't do the same thing with the non-Indian people, the settler colonists. They're often just described as white or English. And in many cases, one thing they are not is English. They might be German are very often, very heavily in large areas of borderland communities, they are Scotch-Irish or Scots-Irish, who are themselves a product of English colonialism and the interplay of forces in Scotland, Ireland, all of that kind of thing. But I've come across these people in so many situations, I thought I really want to pull this together, not as another kind of ethnic contribution study, I'm really interested in them as people who are repeatedly occupying these borderland situations where very often they feel that they are exploited, put in a dangerous situation, and left unsupported by a government that coddles Indian people. And in some cases, their response to that is to turn against the government, you know, the Paxton boys in 1763. It's too easy for me as a historian to dismiss whole 
groups of people as just Indian haters. What's going on here and what can that tell us about not only experiences of these peoples, but the workings of colonialism and how people carve out situations for themselves on borderlands? And of course, as Scots-Irish people are moving, so Indian people are moving, so that you often get Scotch-Irish people meeting Delaware Lenape people, not once, but repeatedly over time on successive frontiers, to use that term again. So I've been floundering around with that during the pandemic. It's taking shape, but it may be a while, I think. You've definitely given us a lot of information to think about. And as we consider everything we discussed today, is there a good place to reach you if we have any questions? You can send me an email colin.calloway at Dartmouth, edu. When people send me questions, I will always answer them. Colin Calloway, thank you for rejoining us and for taking us through Native American experiences in early American cities. It was really fascinating to think about what city life was really like in early America. Well, thank you very much, Liz, and thank you to everybody who sent in questions. It's been a pleasure. Taking the time to explore interactions and relationships between Native Americans and white Europeans and Americans can really help us better understand an important and key story of early America. Interactions between Native Americans and white settlers often involve stories of encounter, conflict, and collisions between indigenous peoples and people of European descent. These relationships also help facilitate war and peace. Moreover, the interactions that took place between Native Americans and white Europeans and Americans offers us a large window through which we can view and understand the power dynamics of early America. In early America, Native American peoples were powerful. Often, they proved more powerful than colonial communities, imperial armies, and the army of the new United States. The power Native Americans had over North American land and over who might control the North American continent is why Europeans and Americans often sought out indigenous allies. Native Americans had the power to protect and disrupt European land claims and early American settlements, towns, and cities. This is why prior to 1800, European empires in the fledgling United States often invited Native American delegations to their cities and honored these delegations with parades, dinners, entertainments, and gifts. This was an acknowledgement and a respect for indigenous power. Now, what we also need to remember about these official indigenous delegations is that they did not always come to early American cities to conduct the trade and diplomacy early Americans wanted them to conduct. Instead, Native Americans often conducted trade and diplomacy largely on their own terms and for their own political and economic benefit. This is important to know. It's also important to know that everyday urban life in early America included interactions between white urban dwellers and indigenous peoples. Knowing all of this information helps us better see and understand the cultural and political fabric of early American society. And it helps us better understand the everyday world that both Native Americans and white early Americans lived and experienced. You'll find more information about Colin, his book, The Chiefs Now in the City, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today. And we did talk about a lot of different books. You'll find all of this information on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 314. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. If you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omaha Dro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omaha Dro Institute's digital audio team, Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what did you think of Colin's question? How does thinking about 18th century Indians as theater goers change to or add to your view of Native Americans? And how do you think this idea might have impacted early Americans' perceptions and ideas about Native Americans? Let me know. Liz, at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.